The year of 2022 has come to an end, and like any year, I spent a lot of time watching movies. I saw so many movies this year, I reached platinum membership status. I usually rate movies and shows out of 10, but just to save myself the time of trying to keep track of what I rate everything to be consistent, I'll just let my review speak for itself, and then tell you all if it's good, bad, or whatever, and if I recommend it or not. I watched a total of 39 movies this year, so I won't waste any more time and get straight into the review, starting with the first movie that I watched this year. Scream, not to be confused with Scream, is the fifth Scream movie in the Scream franchise. I'm sure you're already wondering how many more times I'm going to say the word Scream, but I don't have an answer for you. Anyways, I really like this franchise, but I will admit it's not consistent in quality. I strongly believe the third movie is the worst, with the fourth one being whatever. So, going into the fifth movie, I was prepared to be disappointed, but I wasn't. This installment is more meta than ever, and I had a great time watching it. If you pay close attention, it may be a little predictable, but by the end, I was not disappointed. It's such a solid solid entry in fact that I don't feel that there needs to be a sixth film, but movie studios see money, movie studio make more movie. It's nothing new. Overall, it's a good horror flick and especially good for a fifth entry in a franchise that hasn't had a true banger since the original. If you like Scream and haven't seen this one, definitely check it out. If you haven't seen Scream, watch the first four before you watch this one. Before I saw Jackass Forever, I had never sat down to watch a Jackass movie. I had just seen clips on YouTube, but I thought I had a good idea of what I was in for. But lo and behold, I was not prepared for some of the stuff they did in this movie. Movie. This movie left me cringing and squirming, but I had a really good time. I saw it with a big group of friends, and that's probably the best crowd for this movie. If you want to watch a bunch of jackasses, pun intended, hurt themselves, check this movie out. This may shock you all, but I've never played the Uncharted video games. I know, I know, I suck. But I don't have to play the video game to know that most video game movie adaptations suck ass. And I mean, this movie's not much of an exception. It's not horrible, but it borrows from a lot of better adventure films. All this movie has going for it is that Tom Holland is fun to watch. Watch. That's about it. From what I understand, this movie has been in development for so long that Mark Wahlberg got demoted from the lead role of Nathan Drake to playing the old guy from the game. The end result is a fun time if you just turn your brain off, I guess. It's entertaining, charming at times, but pretty dumb all things considered. If you haven't seen this movie, you're not missing out on much. No Exit is a Hulu original that I watched because I saw a trailer for it and thought the premise looked intriguing. Without spoiling the movie, the basic premise is that a group of strangers get stuck at a rest stop during a blizzard. When the main protagonist goes outside at one point, she finds a little girl tied up in the back of a van. It's a pretty basic thriller with an hour and a half runtime, and it stars the guy from the Allstate commercials too. It's not bad, but it's nothing special. If that premise sounds intriguing to you, then give it a shot. What can be said about the Batman that hasn't already been said? I saw an early screening of this, and it was worth the cost of admission. And more. Of course, of course it gets compared to The Dark Knight, but I don't see the need to. They're very different movies with very different takes on both Batman and Gotham as a whole. While The Dark Knight is a crime thriller, The Batman is more of a detective noir thriller. Batman has to solve mysteries and clues left behind by a sadistic serial killer, and I loved every second of it. And there's a lot of seconds in this movie. It's nearly three hours long, but I never felt like it dragged. Robert Pattinson is great in the role of Batman and Bruce Wayne. I really liked his portrayal of Bruce Wayne. Batman is his full-time job, and it consumes him physically physically and mentally. This movie gives him an actual character arc too, so I expect to see him develop as Bruce if they follow through with the sequels. I'll be honest, I wasn't sure how I felt about Paul Dano as the Riddler. His performance was pretty cringeworthy, but the more I thought about it, the more I realized that was kind of the point. Here's a guy who is not physically threatening or intimidating, carrying out murders on a live stream, so of course he puts on a performance. Then there's Zoe Kravitz as Catwoman. Do I even need to say anything? But I will say, Andy Serkis is criminally underused as Alfred, but it's not that big of a deal. Everybody in this movie is doing a great job. The movie as a whole is just really well crafted. Given the state of DC at this time, I'm worried about the sequels, but I really hope they do go forward. Even if you're not a Batman fan, this is still a great piece of cinema and a great noir detective piece. Turning Red is a Pixar movie about a 13-year-old girl who, because of a family curse, turns into a red panda periodically. It's an obvious allegory for a girl starting their period, and as such, I feel like that's really the target demographic for this movie. And as a grown man, I'm not in that group. I don't think it's the worst Pixar movie, but I definitely won't be re-watching it. Honestly, the funniest part of the movie is not even in the movie itself. It's all the reviews people left online calling it satanic propaganda for showcasing Eastern religions and including the topic of menstrual cycles in a kid's movie. It's a cute little animated movie, and at its worst, it's just forgettable. This next movie is so good and so well made and so well acted, and I'm lying. It's f***ing Morbius. I already have a video on Morbius. I don't want to give it any more of my attention. The movie is bad, and I gain no pleasure 
pleasure in talking about it anymore. It's boring, it's dull, it's not interesting, it's not engaging, and it's not entertaining. Do not watch this movie. Just look up the post credit scene, which in and of itself is stupid as fuck. Even the memes are old, like, no, Jared Leto, it has never been and never will be Morbin time. Shut the fuck up. The movie's bad, don't watch it. The third entry in the Fantastic Beasts franchise is a slight step up from the previous entry, but the word slight is doing a lot of heavy lifting. Crimes of Grindelwald is fucking awful, and Secrets of Dumbledore is just marginally better. It's still not good. Then yeah, I'd go as far as to say it is also bad. The first movie is fine, it's just cute good fun. But the second one is just complete nonsense. And now, I thought the third one was the the epic finale, so I was even more confused when it ends without the biggest, baddest, most epic wand fight ever witnessed in history between Dumbledore and Grindelwald. Instead, we get a movie where fucking nothing happens. I remember nothing about this. Like, what was Dumbledore's secrets? That he was gay? It's not a secret. I already knew that. The Queen Turf tweeted about it years ago. If there's one thing this movie does get right, it makes the twist concerning Ezra Miller's character from the second movie not suck that hard. I don't have much else to say. Cute little fantasy creatures don't make a movie good. If you have if you haven't seen this one, I don't think you'll gain anything from seeing it. If you haven't started the Fantastic Beast movies at all, just watch the first one and then pretend like that's where it ends. Everything Everywhere All at Once is phenomenal. I love this movie so much. If you haven't seen it yet, you are missing out because this movie is one you don't want to miss. It's about a Chinese mother who runs a laundromat trying to pay her taxes when she is pulled into a multiversal conflict only she can resolve. I've seen this movie twice and I cried both times. It's beautiful, entertaining as hell, it's emotional, and it's so much fun. If you have not seen this, I recommend all of you watch it and come back here and tell me what you thought. The unbearable weight of massive talent sees Nicolas Cage playing himself down on his luck when he's offered a million dollars to stay with a drug lord played by Pedro Pascal for his birthday. It's the most Nick Cage, Nick Cage movie, and he and Pedro Pascal are so much fun to watch on screen together. It's not a flawless movie, but I thought it was really funny and entertaining. It's an action comedy with little action, though still good when done, but really hitting the mark on the comedy. Of all the Nicolas Cage movies I've seen, this one is my favorite. If anything, watch it for the bromance between Nicolas Cage and Pedro Pascal. The Northman is a revenge epic with a story that has been told many times before, but the movie is exceptionally well crafted and the performances complement it well. While I will go on record and say this is a well-made movie, it's just not the kind of movie I'd want to watch. I saw it in theaters, but I don't think I'll ever watch it again. I really enjoyed the directing and cinematography, but other than that, it's just not something I'm going to go out of my way to watch again. That being said, if you like historical epics, then I'm sure you've already seen this, but if you haven't, definitely check it out. I've already made a video reviewing Doctor Strange in the Multiverse of Madness, but since then my thoughts have changed slightly. While I still like Sam Raimi and the style he brings to this movie, the more I think about the movie overall, the more I dislike it. This does not at all feel like a sequel to Doctor Strange. This feels like a studio mandated adventure Doctor Strange has to take part in. If you want a further breakdown of the movie, go check out my video on it. Overall, it's a fun watch if you turn your brain off, I guess, but it's definitely a weaker entry in the MCU. And for a movie called Multi Multiverse of Madness, it's pretty disappointing. Senior Year is a movie with an interesting premise that is executed poorly. A 17-year-old girl, played by Betty from Spider-Man, falls during a cheer stun and goes into a coma. 20 years later, she wakes up as Rebel Wilson. On paper, that's an interesting concept, I guess. She's 37, but mentally, she's still 17. Never finished her senior year and wants to go back and finish. But the end result is every cliche you can imagine shoved into a movie. It's also a comedy, but it's one of those comedies where it's not funny at all. So yeah, if you haven't seen this movie, don't watch it. Men is a movie about a woman who goes to a British countryside after experiencing a traumatic loss to get away for a bit. It's an A24 movie and listed as horror, so I was pretty excited to see this. Sometimes when I see a movie that I did not like but had exceptional craft, I can acknowledge that movies are an art form and art is subjective. And I'm sure there's a deeper message and meaning here, but fuck me, I am never watching this movie again. I know it's about men and how they're really shitty a lot of the time, but the last 10 minutes of this movie was just so... I don't even know how to describe it. I am not going to recommend this to you all or to anyone in my life. If you're really curious, just look up the last 10 minutes of this movie. I doubt it's on YouTube because it's terribly graphic and just awful. I regret paying to see this in theaters, so yeah, don't watch this movie. Chippendale Rescue Rangers is the best kind of kids movie. It's got enough eye-catching visuals and humor to keep the kids glued to the screen, and enough humor and easter eggs for adults to enjoy too. Like, because it's a parody, they can use Ugly Sonic as a character in this movie. This is the perfect movie to watch with your kids, younger siblings or cousins, nieces or nephews. Even if you watch it by yourself, which is what I did, it's still a fun watch. When I bought a ticket to go see Top Gun Maverick, I had not seen the original Top Gun. While with some friends, I noticed they had it on DVD, so we started watching it. But by that point, I was really 
really drunk and did not actually watch the movie. So when it was time for Top Gun Maverick, I had still not seen the original Top Gun. But to my surprise, I wasn't lost at all. I could tell when they were doing callbacks to the original, and I understood what was happening that was causing so much drama. As for the movie itself, it's really good. This was made to be experienced in the movie theater, and I'm glad I got to see it there twice. This movie is clear-cut US military propaganda, but damn is it good. I've never been a fan of Miles Teller, but he's really good in this. Hell, everybody's good at this, including Tom Cruise, who I also am not a fan of. There's not much else to say about this movie. It made a shit ton at the box office, so I assume most of you all saw it. It's thrilling, exhilarating, emotionally resonating, and a great piece of entertainment. If you have not seen it, I definitely recommend it. Bob's Burgers is a show that I like a lot, so naturally I like the Bob's Burgers movie. If you don't like the show, I don't imagine the movie will change your mind. But if you haven't seen the show, I don't think you have to watch it before the movie. It's a fine jumping in point, and I think it's pretty funny. But like I said, if you don't find Bob's Burgers funny, this movie will not do anything for you. The Black Phone is one of, if not the best horror movies to come out this year. Ethan Hawke plays a sadistic and creepy man who wears masks and kidnaps children in broad daylight and then locks them in his basement. It's really freaky with a lot of tension, but I don't think it was that scary. There's like two or three jump scares. But if you're like me and prepare for them, then you don't jump. The child actors in this movie are really, really good to the point that I was in awe watching their performances. During a very sensitive scene, the younger sister's acting is so realistic it made me uncomfortable. If you like horror movies, this is one you cannot miss. Marcel the Shell with Shoes On is an A24 movie about a shell named Marcel who wears shoes. I'm sure you could infer that, but yeah, the movie's about Marcel and his story. We follow him through his day-to-day -day routine, we spend time with his grandmother, and we hear his perspective on the world and the things around him. The movie is very thought-provoking and emotionally resonant. It's a movie for all ages, but I think the adults watching it will enjoy it more and take away more from it. It's a good movie that will leave you feeling just as good in the end. Thor Love and Thunder is a movie I've already reviewed on this channel, and just like Doctor Strange 2, the more I think about this movie, the less I like it. Check out that video for my thoughts on it, but in short, I think the movie's tone is schizophrenic, it tries way too hard to be funny, and fails often. It completely wastes Christian Bale and the character of Gore the God Butcher, and it just tosses away the potential for a story involving Thor and the Guardians of the Galaxy. Overall, it's disappointing. I was pumped for this one, but in the end, I was severely let down. If you thought I was going to repeat my thoughts on this next movie, the answer is nope. I'm not going to because I already made a video on it as well. Nope is the third film from director Jordan Peele, and my thoughts on it haven't really changed. I did see it a second time since that video, and I guess, if anything, I do like it a little bit more after a second viewing. I don't think Peele will ever top Get Out, but I really like Nope a lot more than Us. For my full thoughts on Nope, check out the video on my channel. Vengeance is directed by BJ Novak and stars BJ Novak in the lead role. In this movie, he travels to rural Texas after a girl he hooked up with was found dead and begins to record a podcast surrounding her life and death while slowly unraveling the mystery surrounding it. I thought it would be a thriller, but if anything, it was a slow burn social commentary. Still, I thought it was definitely worth watching and BJ Novak was very entertaining. Despite it not being a murder mystery thriller like I thought it was going to be, I like this movie and would recommend it. It's free on Peacock, so if you have that, definitely check it out. Bullet Train sees Brad Pitt fighting a star-studded cast on a train that goes very fast, and it's a lot of fun to watch. It's not a stellar piece of cinema, but I really enjoyed watching it, and I know most people will too. There's a handful of fun cameos, there's good action, great performances, funny moments, and plenty of charm. As a whole, any of the dumb sh** in this movie is overshadowed by the fact that what you're watching is just really entertaining. If you haven't seen it yet, I definitely recommend it. Lightyear is a movie that exists, but really doesn't need to. I don't have many thoughts on this movie. It has good animation, which which is good because this movie's animated, and a solid voice cast, which is good because it requires voice acting, but story-wise, it's pretty bland. I don't know of anybody who thought, you know, I really wish we could see the movie that spawned a line of Buzz Lightyear toys in the Toy Story universe. Because that's what this movie is, which I did not know going into it, but it's the first thing they tell you with text on the screen. If you have kids, they'll probably like it, and it's on Disney+, Plus, so it's there when you need something to turn on. If you like Pixar movies but haven't seen Lightyear, it's not special you're not missing out on much. Prey is a Hulu original that I did not know was coming out until I heard the usual suspects on YouTube and Twitter call it woke garbage. So once it came out, I gave it a watch, and to my surprise, those same people suddenly lost interest in talking about it. The reason for that is that this movie is actually really good, despite having a female lead which these weirdos online swear is the death of a movie. It's a prequel in the Predator franchise which has had some pretty shitty sequels and reboots, but I really like this one. If you have Hulu, check this one out because it is sick.
Bodies, Bodies, Bodies is a movie about a bunch of Gen Zers doing Gen Z things in Pete Davidson's family's mansion during a hurricane. Things go south when somebody dies during a game of Bodies, 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 and it becomes a whodunit murder mystery. Except, it's not a whodunit murder mystery, and if you've seen it, you know what I mean. This one's probably gonna be hit or miss with people. I thought it satirized Gen Z behavior really well while also giving adequate commentary to it. I enjoyed this movie, but I understand why some people didn't. I say, tamper your expectations and give it a shot. Spider-Man No Way Home may have released last Last year, but the extended version came out this year, which I went to see in theaters. I'm not reviewing No Way Home here. I'm saving that for a Phase 4 video. I'm just gonna talk about the new stuff in the extended version. And honestly, there's not much to say. The best part is the extended dialogue between the three Spider-Men, which should have stayed in the original cut to begin with. It felt like the bulk of the new scenes were Betty Brant, who only had one scene in the original version. She has a ton of new scenes and even gets the post credit scene. This should have been called Spider-Man No Way Home, the Betty version. If I were to show someone No Way Home for the the first time, I would still show them the original. When I went to see Barbarian, I saw it had pretty good reviews, which got me excited because horror movies nowadays tend to be average or awful. The trailer shows a woman checking into a house she had booked online, only to find Bill Skarsgård already there, who booked it on Airbnb. He invites her inside, and the movie is about trusting or not trusting strangers. Except, it's not about that at all. The trailer shows a creepy basement and Bill Skarsgård crawling on the ground. The trailer paints Bill Skarsgård's character as the bad guy, but spoiler alert, he's not. Halfway through through the movie, it cuts away from the central conflict and reveals it's a movie about something entirely different. So when this happened, I just lost interest. It's a movie that markets itself as one thing, but halfway through becomes something completely different. If you like those kinds of movies, I guess give this a shot, but I just did not like this movie. I'm not gonna say don't watch it solely because I didn't like it, and instead I actually want more people to watch it so I can hear what they thought of it. Pearl is a prequel to the movie X, which I did not know and did not see prior to seeing Pearl. I just saw the trailer for Pearl and thought, hey, that looks pretty good. I still have not seen X, but it's on my list of things to do in the new year. On its own, I did enjoy it. And this solidified Mia Goth as one of my favorite actresses. If you have not seen X or Pearl, do not watch Pearl first like I did. Go watch X and then decide if you want to watch Pearl. Based on the trailers alone, I thought Smile was going to be a cheesy C-grade trash horror movie, but to my surprise, it was actually really Really good. It was not one-dimensional at all. It's not elevated horror, but it never felt cheap or cheesy. It was actually pretty scary at times. And unlike many horror movies that involve a curse or a virus, this movie actually sticks to the concept and rules it establishes. I was so close to writing it off as a bad horror movie, because I thought, you can't end it here, this is so stupid. But then, the movie didn't end. It kept going. I kept thinking, you have to end it this way. And it did. It was perfect. If you're a horror movie fan, this is one of the best ones of 2022. Enough about good horror movies. It's time for a bad one. Halloween Ends is f***ing garbage. This might be the most disappointing film of the year. I really like 2018's Halloween, and I was hopeful for a good ending to this soft reboot of a trilogy. Halloween Kills wasn't that good, but we still got to see Michael Myers kill people in Michael Myers fashion. But in Halloween Ends, Michael Myers is not even the main focus. He's a complete afterthought. How the f*** do you market the end of the Halloween franchise, the ultimate showdown between Laurie Strode and Michael Myers, and then have the main focus of the movie be some random kid who did a manslaughter and got away with it, and have Laurie's granddaughter fall head over heels for this guy. As I sat in the movie theater and checked my watch and realized we're about halfway through the movie, I realized, Sh this is what the movie's about. Oh my god, is this even a Halloween movie? It's just fucking awful. This is an insult to the franchise. I don't know how anyone found this enjoyable. I had actually planned to make a video on this trilogy back in October, but just never did it. Sorry, guys. In hindsight, Kills and Ends were studio-mandated sequels greenlit after the success of the 2018 Halloween, while the writers and director had no overarching plan for the trilogy. If you did not see this movie, do not waste your time. It's so bad, and I fucking hate it. I'll be honest, I had no intention of watching Black Adam, but then I got COVID for the first time, and once I recovered, I just wanted to go to the movies. Going in, I did not anticipate this being a good movie. I just wanted dumb, cool superhero action. And yeah, I got that. The movie is pretty dumb, but I like some of the jokes and some of the fights. I don't think The Rock is a great actor, but I got the feeling he was at least enjoying the role and wanted to be in this movie. Sucks for him, though, because it looks like he'll never play him again. I know nothing about Black Adam, but I have seen Shazam, so when I saw Black Adam, I 
I was like, oh, okay, so his powers are connected to Shazam's powers. That's cool. Then I read somewhere that Black Adam is one of Shazam's biggest villains, but then I also read that The Rock turned down a cameo in Shazam 2 because he only wants to play in the big leagues, which translates to I want to fight Superman. Seems like nobody is getting what they want over at DC anymore. As far as recent DC movies go, this is definitely one of the better ones, but it's by no means flawless or even really a good movie. If you turn your brain off and just go along with it, it's pretty enjoyable. It's on HBO Max already, so if you have a subscription, just give it a shot. I cannot believe I'm saying this, but Black Panther Wakanda Forever is the best Marvel movie to come out this year. This feels like the only MCU movie in Phase 4 that didn't have any studio interference. They had the whole script written and ready to go, but then Chadwick Boseman passed away. And truth be told, I would have understood if they just shelved the film permanently. But having seen what they came up with following his passing, it's clear that everyone involved wanted to make this happen and honor Boseman's legacy. Starting the movie off with the side characters from the previous Black Panther cope with the death of T'Challa is a real kick in the stomach, because that's a loss we all felt in the real world. And now that he's gone, these people go from side characters to main characters. Letitia Wright steps the f*** up in this movie, and Angela Bassett gives this her all. Namor is an interesting antagonist, and I hope to see him more in the future, and to my surprise, Ironheart was an actual character that I actually want to see more of, so I'm looking forward to her series. I do wish they used M'Baku more in the movie, but it is what it is. This movie is very emotional and exhausted me by the end, so when the post credit scene came on, the tears really started flowing. I'm not ashamed to admit it. I never imagined I'd like the movie as much as I did, but is it better than the first Black Panther? Honestly, I can't bring myself to say the one without Chadwick Boseman is the better movie, but Wakanda Forever is easily a better film. The cinematography, visual effects, and performances are a huge step up from the original, but I just miss T'Challa so much. If you're into the MCU but for some reason have not seen this one yet, be sure not to skip it and have some tissues nearby. 2022 saw Ryan Johnson follow up Knives Out with Glass Onion and Knives Out Mystery. This movie sees Daniel Craig spiraling into his own unique form of depression during the COVID-19 pandemic as he's left without murder mysteries to solve and happens to really suck ass at games like Clue and Among Us. He finds himself invited to a private island owned by an analog for every tech billionaire to ever exist in our world, and when someone winds up dead, Detective Blanc is on the case. I, like many people, really love Knives Out and was eagerly waiting for a sequel. After three years of waiting, it's finally here. While I think the first Knives Out is better, Glass Onion was still entertaining and I really enjoyed it. The setup and approach is different from the first one, which may turn off some people. I see people bashing this movie for being a waste of time and misdirecting people, but I mean, it's a murder mystery movie? I don't know what else to tell you. This movie successfully gaslit me, and even when I was confident I knew who the perpetrator was, I was still left guessing how and why they did it until Daniel Craig spells it all out. The cast is great, everyone is obnoxious in their own right, and it leaves you not knowing who to trust. I think the original Knives Out is still better, but Glass Onion was really enjoyable. If you have not seen Knives Out at all, watch it before you watch Glass Onion. The Menu is a movie I thought was one thing going in, but when I saw what it actually was, I I actually liked it more. I thought it was a horror movie, but it really wasn't. It's more of a dark comedy thriller. It stars Anya Taylor-Joy and Ray Fiennes and sees a group of wealthy guests attend a luxurious dining experience, but not all is as it seems. I don't want to give anything else away, but it has some good social commentary and is overall pretty tense. There's no jump scares or monsters. There's just a lot of tension as you sit there not sure what's going to happen next. I love Anya Taylor-Joy and Ray Fiennes is also great. The menu hits HBO Max on January 3rd, so if you have a subscription, be sure to check it out. David Harbour stars as a John Wick-esque Santa Claus in Violent Night. The premise is pretty straightforward. Santa Claus delivers presents, and while doing so, he finds a little girl and her whole family being held hostage. The trailer shows nearly all the action beats, which is the only reason I would want to watch this movie. Anyways, it's nothing special, but David Harbour is still charming as ever. This is the only Santa Claus movie that gives Santa an interesting backstory, but it's not really elaborated on beyond showing you a few glimpses. Oh, it also stars Translucent from The Boys. He's pretty good. The movie is decently funny, and it's Santa Claus playing John Wick light. If seeing Santa Claus brutally murder mercenaries sounds like a good time, definitely check this out now or next Christmas. 13 years after the original release, we finally have an Avatar sequel, and it's... Fine. It's just fine, really. I've never been an Avatar fan or hater, but I have been looking forward to this movie solely because I wanted to see what 13 years of waiting would pay off with, and how the box office numbers would look. Avatar was a technical marvel and released at the height of 3D's popularity. Nowadays, 3D is not that popular, and the novelty of the original has just worn off. It was just a movie that everyone went to see when it came out, but it really had no cultural impact. I know James Cameron would fight me over that comment, but it's true. I've never said to someone, hey, what was that thing you just said? 
Fighter thing you just did, and they reply with, oh, that was an Avatar reference. You made a cool movie with blue people having hair sex with plants, James. Congratulations. The Way of Water is a sequel to the first Avatar, obviously, but it's kind of a soft reboot, too. The first Avatar does not demand a sequel by the end. The humans are expelled, so in order to give the movie conflict, they just come back to colonize Pandora a second time. They rise of Skywalker, the villain from the first movie, because just like Palpatine, somehow the Colonel returned. At least this movie spells out how he comes back. Whatever, the movie needs something to drive the plot forward. The movie is three hours and 12 minutes long, but I never felt the runtime until the third act. Once everything was blown up, I was like, oh my god, we're still not done. There's another fight and ending sequence left. Story-wise, it's nothing special. Just like the original. This movie soars in its visual effects. Just like the original. Still, I had a good time watching this, and by no means would I say it's a bad movie. But I wasn't left dying to see a third, fourth, and fifth movie, which apparently we're still getting. I'm just not invested in Avatar's lore. Partly because it feels like I'm supposed to be, but I'm just not. If anything, this movie is just good escapism and stimulation for your eyeballs. Babylon is a three-hour movie about making movies. It stars Margot Robbie, Brad Pitt, and a bunch of other big names, and it's f***ing exhausting. It's also really gross and messy. The trailer gives no indication as to what the movie's about. The general concept is just 1920s Hollywood and all the shit that happens inside it. The trailer gave the vibe of Wolf of Wall Street meets Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, but those are two very good movies, and this one isn't really. It's raunchy as all hell, but it feels way too forced. This movie takes the R rating as far as it can for no reason other than to make you gag or cringe. Like, three minutes into the movie, you get a POV shot of an elephant shitting into the camera directly and then onto someone. Then a few minutes later, a woman pees in a dude's mouth, and that's followed by a drawn-out sequence of a lavish drug-fueled orgy party. As of recording this, it's a certified box office bomb, having made less than $5 million. That's about $245 million shy of what they need to start turning a profit. It's a movie about making movies, it's as long as Avatar, it's got a hard R rating, and the marketing was not very good, so it's no surprise that it bombed. I don't know who this movie is for except cinephiles. I was excited for it, and I like some of the stuff in it, but in the end, I don't plan to watch it ever again. That is every movie I saw in 2022. I will now quickly list the top five worst and best movies in my opinion, starting with the worst. Number five, Senior Year. Number four, Fantastic Beasts, The Secrets of Dumbledore. Number three, Men. Number two, Morbius. And number one, Halloween Ends. And now for the best movies. Number five, The Menu. Number four, Nope. Number three, Top Gun Maverick. Number two, The Batman. And number one, Everything Everywhere All at Once. Thank you all for watching this video. I know there are plenty of things I missed this year, so if you saw a movie that I didn't see and didn't cover, be sure to leave a comment and I'll check it out. Going into 2023, you can expect more consistent uploads and the start of my streaming career once Jedi Survivor releases. Don't forget to subscribe with notifications on and hit that like button. I'm Remnicor, I will see you all in the next one.